so. That's, that, that's, that's assuming a lot, Matthew. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Man, it was late night last night, so I'm so glad you're all here. So um, anyway, uh, I know we're running a little bit late with the keynote. I'm going to try to be on time as much as possible, even if we're um, having a bit of a late start. Uh, I was going to stand at a podium, but apparently you can't see me if I'm um, behind the laptop. So I'm going to, but I'm going to be peeking in and out so I can uh, cheat and look at my notes. So um, anyway, I'm here to talk to you about framing DEI globally. Um, it's a conversation that uh, people have been having, I think, for a while for a variety of reasons. And um, I wanted to provide um, uh, some frameworks through which to view DEI, um, as well as relate some of my personal experiences around it, because I think it's super important um, to have storytelling as a part of um, furthering DEI efforts. So um, a little bit of who I am, I think I know most people in the room, but um, so I've been working in open source for uh, nearly nine years. And before working in the tech industry, I was working in higher education administration, uh, nonprofits and arts organizations. Um, so I've got um, quite a bit of experience across the board in um, very different industries. Um, I'm someone who's got an international background. I've lived in numerous places, um, including abroad in the Philippines and France, and in different regions of the United States, uh, including Hawaii, California, Virginia, North Carolina, Rhode Island. And so I was born in Hawaii, I was in the Bay Area for a little bit, um, bebopped over to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and in Providence, Rhode Island, and now I am in Durham, North Carolina, uh, which is 30 minutes north of Red Hat Tower, if people uh, know where that is. Um, and so as part of my job, I travel pretty extensively. I've been to pretty much every region. Um, and I get to interact with a lot of different people, which is honestly one of the best parts um, of this role. Like it actually really satisfies um, my desire to, to learn new things and um, meet new people because I just have a natural curiosity um, about the world. Um, and Back in the day, I also did graduate work um, around issues of diversity um, and equity and inclusion. And so um, DEI has evolved a lot in the time um, I did that kind of work. And so I did a certificate in women's studies. Uh, it's actually not called women's studies anymore. It's called gender, sexuality, and feminist studies. And um, that was from uh, Duke University in Durham, which is where I still live. Um, and then I also co-founded the Red Hat Asian Network, and I um, currently serve as its chair, um, but even though I'm chair of the Asian Network, I am deeply interested in intersectionality because we don't just have one thing about us. We have lots of different things about us, right? Um, all of us are very multifaceted, and that includes myself. So before we get started, I wanted to talk about the definitions over diversity, equity, inclusion, and I also threw in justice in there. Uh, and part of the reason uh, I put this up is that I thought this was a really cool framing because it asks a series of questions. Um, and that's the way that I want people to approach DEI. It's, there, there are no absolutes. There's a lot of questioning. There's a lot of conversation. It is not a linear process, right? Um, and I thought this was a really, really nice framing. Um, and then, you know, most people probably have not seen the justice part, right? I feel like the justice part um, provides additional nuance to the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece, right? Because, you know, people think of diversity, it's like, okay, we just need a lot of different people in the room, uh, and it's uh, solved. Um, but then, you know, you have to ask, well, who's not in the room? And then when you're in the room, are you allowed to be heard? Like, are your ideas allowed to be heard? And then, um, if your idea is heard, is it gonna be taken as seriously? Like, are people actually gonna think that you have any credibility even if you choose to speak up? So, so there's a series of steps in it. And, you know, part of what I wanna say about this journey, because it is a journey, um, is all of us are learning together. So maybe you're learning, but you know what? I'm learning just as much as you are. So I would never ever style myself as an expert. I can only say that here are my experiences, here's the research, let's have a conversation and evaluate everything together. Uh, because I was trained to be a researcher and a questioner, 
And, you know, I want to make sure that I have an understanding of where you are. And I hope that I can express an understanding of where I'm at. So I want to talk a little bit about diversity, because people are like, well, what does diversity entail? And actually, there was some research uh, done by a person named Amy Edmondson uh, out of Harvard. And she actually is uh, one of the very first people to write about something called psychological safety. Has everyone heard of psychological safety? Raise your hand if you've heard of psychological safety. Like, it, like we've been talking a lot about it. I'm going to talk a bit about what that means. Um, but before we go into psychological safety, I want to talk about team diversity. And so uh, she identified four different types of team diversity along with um, another research there, Catherine Roloff, and a bunch of people are working in this field now. Um, so we're going to go through the different parts, and then I want people to raise their hand if they think it applies to them. So the first one is demographic diversity. Um, so it means you've got a variety of people on your team. Maybe there's some disparity. So maybe you've got a bunch of identity groups. You know, maybe they're from another country, another part of the country, um, another race, another culture, different sexual orientation. Um, st you know, stuff that maybe this is your typical um, definition of diversity. Um, so does anyone belong to a team like that, where you have people who kind of fit that definition? All right, so, so a lot of you. Um, the second um, type of diversity is expertise. So you've got a bunch of different skill sets. You've got some people who may be senior. You may have people who are junior. You may have people who are really great at this one thing, and other people are great at this another thing. So who has been in a group or is in a group where there are different levels of expertise, where you have junior and senior members or have been a part of a team like that? OK, great. All right, so this third one, I think this may actually apply to a lot of people. Uh, geographically dispersed team members. Who has to work with teams in other regions that are not where you live? OK, a bunch of you. All right. And then the fourth one is disparity. And so um, at Red Hat, we like to think that we have a flat reporting line, but I work in marketing. And so we're um, more of a traditional corporate structure where there are social norms of deference to authority. So, you know, basically, uh, usually in open source, we say titles don't matter, but, you know, sometimes they do. Um, and so if you've got some sort of reporting structure where you've got a manager, and people under them, um, that would be basically that kind of framework. So who is on a team where you've got someone above you and maybe people below you in terms of hierarchy? OK, all right. So it looks like the majority of you fit into one of these categories of diversity when it relates to your team, or maybe all four. I actually have all four. so. Uh, so yeah, all sorts of diversity. And so I think it's really important to frame what we mean by diversity and how um, it can apply in different situations. So I have been doing this work, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and justice, and other subsets within this uh, world for a very, very long time. I don't want to tell you how long, because it'll give away my age, but I've been doing this uh, for decades. And there's something that comes up in every situation that I've been in, um, and I think this is universal. Um, and one of the things that I want people to take away is that DEI is not separate from your everyday experiences. It's a part of how we experience the world, even if you don't think you're experiencing the world in a way that involves that. But some of my observations is that people have a very deep need to belong. People are always asking, what's, what's my place in the world? And can others understand my experience? And another thing that I've noticed is people need to be seen and validated. You know, people need to feel their contributions matter. And not only do they matter, but I'd like to be recognized for the contributions that I make. Um, the other thing that's come up is can I bring my whole self into situations without fear or self-consciousness? You know, 
So an example would be like, if people knew something about me, you know, that I'm different in some way, um, you're automatically operating from a place of fear and hypervigilance, and that is not a fun place to be. Uh, and so I think it's very, very important for people to be able um, to be in an environment where they can be their whole self without judgment um, and without fear. Uh, and then another really fundamental thing that comes up time and time again, and it doesn't matter where your opinion is um, around DEI, is that people are really concerned about fairness. Um, people really focus on what's fair and how do we get to fairness, right? And to me, the way that I define fairness is, you know, I want the same access to resources and support. You know, like if there's one group getting access to, to support and resources, I, I'd like to think that I, too, would have the same access to those resources and support. And then I also want access to opportunities. I want an opportunity um, to grow uh, and to, to evolve um, into something better than what I know, or evolve into circumstances better than what I know. So let's go back to psychological safety, right? So I talked about bringing the whole self to work or even to your everyday life, maybe the grocery store, you know, maybe while you're walking around your neighborhood. Um, so psychological safety, you know, maybe you think of it in terms of being an individual, uh, but it, you know, it relates to a setting or role where people can express themselves, right? They can, um, and, th and in this particular instance, work relevant thoughts and feelings, right? Um, and psychological safety also includes in its definition permission to make mistakes. Uh, if you've made a mistake, can you raise your hand? Who's, who's ever made a mistake? <laughs> if you haven't, I want to know who you are. I'd like, I'd like to know who you are if you've never made a mistake, right? Um, and so not only is there permission to make mistakes, but there's permission to learn from those mistakes. You know, uh, back in the day, uh, we used to have this sticker at Red Hat that said, fail better. Does anyone remember that? I don't know if anyone ever saw that sticker. I actually had that on my laptop. I loved it. Because that was like such a mind-blowing thing to see something like that in the workplace. And I took it away because people were misinterpreting it and saying, uh, okay, yeah, that people aren't understanding what it means. But for me, I was like, this is great. You know why? Because it means I'm allowed to make mistakes and learn from them and be better. Afterwards. That's how I um, interpreted it. And so I think everyone should have permission to fail better. I give you permission to fail better, you know? So um, don't be self conscious if you make mistakes. I think the key, too, is if you make a mistake, what do you learn from it? How can you grow from it? But you know what? We can't define psychological safety without talking about teams. Because really, psychological safety is related and dependent on teams. And why is that? Why would teams be important in psychological safety? Hmm, you know. Part of it is a setting, right? Like think about um, maybe a past work experience or a past school experience, think about um, a teacher or a leader. Uh, think about the ones that made you feel afraid and judged. And then think about the places where you felt safe, where you could laugh, where you could share things that were uncomfortable and know that you would be supported. Have people been in both those environments? Have you been in an environment where it's like, ugh, you know, I'm afraid to speak up because I'm not sure what that means for me. Um, and have you been in an environment where it's, hey, this is great, and with people that I really trust, and I know that I can rely on them to have my back. Um, and actually, that's how I feel uh, like when I'm at Flock. So thank you, community. Um, I always feel super supported um, in this community, and the Fedora community is one of my favorite communities for that reason. Uh, like, I can nerd out and be my weird self without judgment. I don't know that jackhammer sounds like it has judgment, but it's okay. All right. 
Another thing that I want to talk about, right, if, is if we talk about diversity by itself, you know, people assume falsely that if you create a diverse team, everything's solved. Yay! Hey, all of our issues are solved because we put a bunch of different people together um, and they're going to work on a team and they're going to solve everything because they're all different. Well, studies have shown that diverse teams often underperform relative to homogenous teams. What? You mean putting a bunch of different people together actually doesn't work to create an environment that's more productive? Why is that? Part of the reason why it doesn't work is that there is no framework for communication. You have to reimagine the world when you are working with people that are different from you. So just think about it. If you have a bunch of senior members on your team that have been doing open source for 10, 15 years, and you have a newbie that comes in that doesn't know the terminology, um, that knows how to access command line, but they're not sure where to start or where to go, you have to interact with that person differently. You can't interact with that person like they have 10 or 15 years of experience. And if you did, what does that bring out, right? It brings out a lot of fear and smallness because this person doesn't want to ask questions because they know that they're assumed to have a certain knowledge and skill set that they don't possess. So we have to set expectations. We have to set um, frameworks for when we deal with team members that come in. And as I cited, there are different forms of diversity, right? So there are different things that you may have to do to address those types of diversity. But the key thing is creating a communication framework into which um, all groups can work and understand. Right? So here are some things that you can do to ensure that your diverse team excels, right? So framing is super, super important. We have to be able to frame things as a way to provide opportunities for information sharing. So if you've got that junior person on your team that's never been um, an open source, and they, but they want to be an open source, you have to create a framing with meetings where it's opportunity to share information. You know, informa information sharing is really, really key, right? And then we want to frame differences as a source of value, right? You know, one of the things I loved when I came to Red Hat is the idea that the best idea wins and it doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter if it comes from your intern or the CEO, the best idea wins, right? And that's part of, you know, like I think about like even in terms of my height, because <laughs> I'm really short. And there are things I don't think about because I'm short. So for instance, when I'm on the airplane and I stand up on my seat, I don't hit um, this part. Like I just stand there. Uh, versus like someone like Adam probably can't do that. But it's not part of my everyday experience, so I don't think about stuff like that. Uh, and then another thing that I think about is that like, my refrigerator is very high at home, and my husband likes to put things on the top shelf, and I don't ever see them. I can only see eye level. Right? And so we have to consider, what are people experiencing? right? And you have to frame those differences. right? So one of the things I've asked my husband to do is, like, can you put stuff that I actually use on the lower shelf so that I can reach it and actually see it, and not by, like, five other items that are identical because I didn't realize that all that stuff was in, on the top shelf. So anyway, so, that, so, that, so it's very important. You, know, you want to you have conversations that frame those differences. And then inquiries. Like I told people I have a natural curiosity about the world and I ask a lot of questions. I ask a lot of open-ended questions. And sometimes listening is really, really hard, you know, especially if we're already attached to an outcome, or attached to a certain expectation, or attached 
to a belief system, you know? You know, I may be of the mindset, because I don't ever hit my head when I stand up on a plane, that, like, I don't know what the big deal is. Why, why are people complaining about not having enough space? Come on. Suck it up. I can stand perfectly fine. Now, you know, I've got clearance, too. You know? But you know what? I know that's not the experience of other people. You know? I'm sure that folks who are uh, vertically challenged this way um, have their own sets of issues. You know, maybe you can't be in a hotel room without having your feet hang over the bed, you know? And it's impossible for you not to ever have your knees hit the seat in front of you, uh, which is probably pretty excruciating uh, on a long flight, right? And so I wanna ask questions like, hey Adam, what's that like? Do you find that comfortable? Or do you wish that on other people? <laughs> Yeah, he wishes on other people. Okay, that's good to know. All right. Um, but part of these questions, right, is you also are trying to find, like, shared ownership and causality. And what do we mean by shared ownership and causality? Part of it is we're trying to establish understanding of different things, right? So we're, we're putting things in the pile. It's, I, I, I call it, like, recipe making. So, like, if you're trying to create something... Um, as a group, if you're in a project of some sort. Um, I always like to use the recipe analogy, where like if you're wanting to bake a cake, you can't bake a cake just with, that, uh, with just flour, or with just eggs, or with just butter, or with just sugar. You need all those things to come together with a certain magic so that you can have a baked good at the end. And I love baked goods. So who doesn't like baked goods, right? Um, and then we have to talk about bridging boundaries, right? So people have a natural threshold for comfort because of their experiences, you know. They may be only comfortable with, you know, this much space. Like, personal space is another thing that I think is always really intriguing when I travel. Um, I think in the United States, we like to have an arm's length um, as comfortable personal space. Um, but I've been in cultures where people are right on top of me and almost touching me. Uh, and it's kind of like, whoa, okay, there's something I have to understand here because uh, this is their norm, it's not my norm. Um, and so I need to figure out where people's boundaries are, right? Um, and so part of how you bridge boundaries, again, is without open-ended questions. Like, if we, you're working on a project, everyone's got hopes and goals for that project, right? So if we're in a work setting, a lot of us are assigned things that we're um, needing to do and accomplish. Um, and it may be that the various people on your team have very different hopes and goals. And you know what? That's actually very important to know that. So your senior person may have very different goals from your junior person. And you need to have a recognition of what they are so those gaps can be bridged, right? Uh, and then you wanna do an inventory of your resources and skills, right? So one thing like with a newer person is they may see things that you won't see because you're so used to doing things a certain way, you may not see something that actually needs to be seen and someone less experienced or less familiar can see those things because they're still learning. And so, those are the things you want to think about is that, you know what, just because this person does not have the same experience as you do, they're still bringing something. Um, and then this part about concerns and obstacles, I think, is super, super important, particularly if you are leading a team. Uh, but this is a conversation that you also want to have as a team so people have an understanding of what's going on. Like, what are people up against? What are you worried about, you know? Sometimes these are one-on-one -on -one conversations and sometimes these are conversations that you want to have as a team. But it's very, very important what people's obstacles are, um, like in actuality, maybe with process, but also, you know, psychologically, you know, maybe people are held back by fear. They don't want to make a mistake, because if they make a mistake, then, oh no, the world ends, right? Uh, but th does the world really end? So part of it is you have to put people's fears in perspectives, and maybe you have to put your own fears in perspectives, because usually the world won't end. Maybe your servers will go down for two months, and that's terrible, but, you know, the world's not really ending. Or for some people, it might. 
So I want to talk a little bit about inclusion and how you evaluate teams. Um, so this is, I'm not going to read through all these questions, but um, I found this article by Chelsea Troy about how you evaluate uh, team members' contributions for inclusive culture. And I've already kind of gone through a, a version of this with my last slide, but I thought this was really great. You know, so part of what you want to look at in your team, are, are they able to moderate their meetings? Are they able to make sure that people are expressing their opinions? And then uh, if they're not, you know, find a way to solicit them. I mean, there are people who are both extroverts and introverts. There's some people that like to give verbal feedback or written feedback. And so it's really, really important to provide different forums to, um, to do meetings for feedback. So same with soliciting opinions, attribution. Oh, attribution is super important. So one thing that I think um, that I already um, spoke about was the need for people to feel recognized, right? Um, and in another really common experience is people expressing an idea and then someone taking credit for it, right? So one thing that I think that's really, really important to realize is that um, it's important to recognize a contribution given by someone uh, and not appropriating it. And if you're appropriating it, you know, ask yourself why you're doing that. Um, usually it's related to wanting to have power over someone. And, you know, that actually doesn't really create a great team dynamic. And what it does is it shuts people down. So, you know, let's go ahead and give recognition to people because you know what, it lifts you up too. Because you're seen as someone who is a supporter, as someone who is here to uplift and make people's lives better. And honestly, you will get so much in return by doing that instead of being small and taking credit for something that you didn't do. So, all right, I'm just going to go through that. So, because I want to be mindful of time. So, I want to talk about the power of the individual. So, we talk a lot about individuals, particularly within American culture. Um, and I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, you know, because people always ask about, like, what can my company do? What can my organization do? Um, but sometimes it's up to the individual. It's up to an individual uh, exercising their own power, um, even when they're fearful. So one of my favorite quotes is, speak the truth even if your voice shakes. And my voice shakes on many occasions because I am not a person that is naturally comfortable with putting myself out there. This is something that I've cultivated over many years. This is not something that's comfortable for me. In fact, I was conditioned not to speak up. Um, my dad was always saying, don't rock the boat. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. But there are times we do have to, to speak up. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my work uh, in creating the Asian network at Red Hat in just a bit. But what's important to realize is that sometimes the greatest changes don't come from organizations themselves. It comes from individuals within organizations or maybe outside organizations. They're willing to put themselves out there to do the work without an expectation of, of compensation. And then um, it also involves relationship building because allies are such an important part of making change happen. Like, I can't make change happen by myself. I have to make sure that other people have buy-in to making things change. Um, and so individuals can start those processes and then they can catalyze things happening. But then we also have to talk about leadership because leadership does matter. Um, one thing about individuals creating great things is that if that individual leaves your organization, there's usually a void. And so your leadership, it's necessary to implement structural changes. So as an example, um, within the United States, um, we had to do a Voting Rights Act for people to uh, have equal access to voting, and that's actually being challenged um, right now. But in theory, everyone always had the right to vote, but in, in order to ensure it, legislation had to be enacted. In other words, structures had to be changed. Because if you're looking to individuals 
our existing structures to make change happen is not going to happen. You are going to have to enact change on a structural level, and in this case, you would do it through legislation. Also, you need leadership because remember when I was talking about when you have diverse teams, you need to have a structure for communication. Uh, it's your leaders that are going to make sure that that infrastructure uh, gets created. And so even though individuals are greatly important, if you want lasting change in your organization, you are going to have to have the buy-in of your leadership to make those things happen. So let's talk about creating inclusive leaders, right? You know, so um, again, I'm an, a fan of the Harvard Business Review, so you'll see that I um, get a lot of citations from articles. Uh, and if you want a copy of my slide deck, I'm glad to give it to you because I have all these links embedded. Um, but when they quizzed leaders about being inclusive, um, inclusive leaders, and we'll go through what makes an inclusive leader in just a bit, they're 17% more likely to report that they're high performing, 20% more likely to say they make high quality decisions, and 29% more likely to report behaving collaboratively. And then it also, increases work attendance. So basically, you know, if you're really hyper-focused on a productivity aspect of DEI, maybe not so much the human element, um, there is a correlation that if you pr practice inclusion, inclusivity, um, that you will thrive. So what are some examples of um, strong inclusive leadership? So when they surveyed people, when they defined a strong, inclusive leader, they said that strong, inclusive leader is not afraid to share their personal weakness. And an example of personal weakness may be, you know, I know uh, I'm good at this, but I am not good at this, and I need your help. I need your help uh, in making sure that I'm understanding things, because this is not my area of strength. So that would be an example of sharing a personal weakness. Um, the other is just learning about cultural differences, realizing that there are different styles. And so, um, like I said, cultural could even extend to someone being introvert or extrovert, um, as well as people being from different regions, different cultures, or different countries. Um, but understanding, okay, here's a preferred way to communicate. Um, here's something that needs to be highlighted. You know. And so that's super important that this leader leans into learning about those things um, and doesn't assume things. They actually want to learn about those different things. And then also um, acknowledging team members as individuals. So, you know, one of my favorite stories I like to, to tell about uh, when I came to Red Hat was um, the afternoon of the first day of new hire orientation, we had a reception where your teams could come and welcome you. And I remember um, there was this gentleman with blue jeans, a belt, and a white button-down shirt. I'm like, who is that person? Why is this person here? Uh, and he was, he's like, hey, I'm here because I want to welcome you to Red Hat. And it was Jim Whitehurst, our CEO. And I'll tell you, I was like, what kind of place am I working at? Um, where the CEO comes to shake my hand and to welcome me and tell me that he's looking forward to me helping make the organization better. I mean, I still remember that story. And I also remember the times that he would come to the booth completely uninvited because he wanted to say hi to Hatters and he would take selfies with all of us. Man, those were really great days. So, Jim Whitehurst, wherever you are, we love you. Um, and then least inclusive behaviors, uh, overpowering others, you know, like getting your way, like my way or the highway. Displaying favoritism, like, I, you know, I think this person can do it best. I don't care about the rest of you. And then discounting alternative views, like my view is the only one that matters because it's the right one. You're like sure that there's nothing else that can be introduced to change your viewpoint. And one thing also that's really important to note is that, you know, we're a lot of organizations are fans of surveys, you know, feedback forms. Um, but it's really important that feedback are distributed results rather than averaged results. Why do you think that is? Because if you average it out, you hide 
where the differences and disparities are in terms of perception. It hides your problems. Um, and so be very suspicious. If, it's like, hey, 80% uh, of people are really happy, you know. You need to kind of dig down a little bit deeper. Is it, is it really 80% or is it, you know, how is this calculated? Uh, data can be manipulated any way you want. So how can you be an inclusive leader? Uh, so it says inclusive leadership shadow. I don't know if anyone is familiar with um, the psychologist Young, but he talks about the shadow side. And all of us have that shadow side. All of us are really convinced that we're really good at what we do, but sometimes we're not. <laughs> and we have to ask people for their feedback. Um, and we have to be visible and vocal about all those things. So one thing to remember is that inclusive leadership needs to be cultivated and conscious. And when it exists, everyone does benefit from that. And I know that we're running out of time, so I'm gonna just blow through these last slides really quickly. Um, one thing I wanna talk about is contact theory, and this goes back to you know, when people think, oh, if I have a diverse team, everything's solved. If I put a bunch of different people together, it's solved. Like my DEI problems you know, are gone, and it's not true. So one thing um, about like putting people together in a room, there's this thing called contact theory. And this one is specific to racial prejudice. But if racial prejudice can only diminish when you're in a group with people, is if you're under certain conditions, and I think this also relates to um, psychological safety that I talked about earlier, which is where everyone is sharing roughly equal status and belonging and working on a common purpose. So if people are very different and they're in the same room, just because they're together does not mean that things will change. The conditions have to be equitable. The conditions have to be fair, feel fair to the people who are in that room together. And they also need to feel like they're part of a larger purpose. So one of the things um, that I have to do on a regular basis is work with people with very different personalities, different backgrounds, for myself, different philosophies of how to get things done. But one thing that I always remind folks when I'm doing a work project with them is like, you know what, in the end we want the same thing. We want to accomplish something together and make it great. What do you think needs to happen for that to be the end result? And that's sometimes hard, but finding that larger purpose that you can agree on makes a huge difference. So, I'm gonna come back to this slide, and so hopefully maybe you understand the justice part a little bit better. You know, the questioning that needs to happen for all of these things to be a reality uh, in your organization. And then I'm gonna just talk really quickly about Red Hat Asian Network, and then I'm gonna let everyone go to their um, next session. Um, but as I said, I was, um, a co-founder for Red Hat Asia Network, and we were actually primarily concerned with Asian Americans. I just wanted to do a shout out to our founding committee. Two of these folks are no longer at Red Hat. Uh, one was laid off, he was a chairman's award winner, uh, was working in the office of CTO, and then uh, another uh, just left to go to another organization. Um, so there's me, and there's Robin Chan, my co-chair, and then Tesh Patel, they're the only ones that are left. Uh, Joe Tsai and Laura Fu are no longer at Red Hat, and actually our executive sponsor just left three weeks ago. Um, so it's um, just a few of us are left who have done this effort. So I just wanna talk a little bit about why I did this organization, because I never talked about DEI at work. It's been a very long time, and now I'm talking about it a lot. But there are different things that happened. One was COVID-19 and the racism that it brought out. And not only the racism but it also brought up a lot of old societal wounds for a lot of Asian Americans about being othered. And now to be blamed for something was pretty painful. Um, and then another thing was that there were a lot of associates who were not being promoted into management. Asian Americans are the least likely group in the US to be promoted to management within tech. And then within tech, it's Asian American women oh, that's me, who are least likely to be promoted into management roles. So one of the things um, that was really important to me was to challenge people's assumptions about belonging to a group. 
Um, so within the United States, we have something called the model minority myth, um, which is that Asians are super successful and they don't need anybody's help. Um, and that's not true for a variety of reasons. First of all, the term Asian American is a socio-political term that evolved in the 1960s. It's an umbrella term for a wide variety of folks. And the reason why it was created was to create a way to ally together to help each other, um, to find a more equitable place, to find uh, opportunities uh, for equal access like other groups. So, I just want to leave you with people being intersectional beings. So, as I said, I'm intersectional. Um, I identify as um, a woman of Filipino descent. Um, I am also neurodiverse. I have ADHD. Um, and I've lived in particular places that inform the way that I am. So, um, anyway, hopefully this is helpful. Like I said, this conversation's not over, and if you want to talk about it a little bit more, I'm happy uh, to talk with you, but hopefully this provides some additional lenses and other things for you to consider that maybe you haven't considered before. So thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Karaoke later. Bye, everybody. Oh, yeah, and stay in touch. Find me on uh, Mastodon or, or Twitter or X or whatever it's called. And then there's my LinkedIn as well as my email. Okay, I'm really done now. Thank you. I think we can go to break now, by the way. FY. <laughs> Our session.